I want to show you this afternoon why, as a Unitarian, in a Unitarian religion for 23 years, and having a mind which was quite rationalistic, and deliberately denying the Word of God because of choice. And because everything I touch my hands to seemed to be successful, and I felt that I did not need God, I did not believe in God, and I did not believe in the Bible. And my entire background was agnostic minus. I did not in any way have any use for Bible people. For 23 years, I felt identically the same way, and the more successful I was, the more I was convinced that I was that, and the Christians were a bunch of stupid individuals. And then, as it happens, the Holy Spirit began to move. I said I wouldn't be, I would definitely never be saved. I oppose anyone that even mentioned the word. You've heard me say that I used to go Sunday mornings in the month of August only to a Unitarian church to figure out who I would have in our baseball teams that afternoon, which we had semi-pro players. It was called the Pine Tree League, a very red-hot league in the state of Maine. Highly attended with crowds, grandstands were full, horns were blowing, the kind of pseudo-prima donna popularity that the flesh really enjoys. <laughs> Managing a winning team in the Pine Tree League with its semi-pro type of speed, having players from the AAA Association, the Louisville team, such as Stanley Farr and Jim Farr and Pot Hathaway and many others, we had an amazing league. However, that didn't save my soul. Strangely enough. Went into the appliance business and immediately turned into overwhelming success. Bought a store and was never supposed to make it. Amazingly made it. And unfortunately, the first year I purchased it, the town went wet for the first time in 60 years. Or maybe a lifetime. But remember the condition of the natural heart deceitful, desperately wicked, but brought up in morality, but not spirituality. Morality, as much as a Unitarian understood that he must have good morals, but within his own human righteousness. So life went on, and then all of a sudden, the Word of God became a challenge in this respect. I was studying the five laws of education from Oxford University. The five laws of education, as suggested by the cream of the crop educators in the world. To simplify them in simple terms so that we can comprehend them in an applicable way, they were as follows. Remember, they are simplified. Number one, the law of intelligence which is the law of the order of thinking. Number two, the law of contrast. Number three, the law of similarities. Number four, the law of consistency. And number five, the law of coordination. If you didn't have a foundation or a basis for educational comprehension and to adopt a philosophy in a certain scientific field or, moreover, a particular philosophy, you would go to the five laws of education and relate to these five laws and out of these five laws come up with truth. Inasmuch as I was an evolutionist, when I entered into the five laws of education from Oxford University, see how this works. The evolutionist says that we derive our life from one unintelligent globe of jelly. This one unintelligent globe of jelly 
completely duplicates itself into many facets until its reproductivity enters into the functionary processes of life. All right? Now take this with the law of intelligence, the law of consistency, the law of contrast, the law of coordination, and the law of assimilarities, the law of assimilarities. There's one law that fit into the category in its limited way with evolution, the law of assimilarities. But no other of the four laws of education from Oxford University did so with this philosophy of evolution. For example, creation must have a creator. Everything that I see has a designer and a creator. The carpet, the pews, the roof, the chapel, the lights, the piano, and, and the amplifier, and so on. That's just the law of intelligence. The law of consistency is this. If that is true, then the 10,000 lakes of Minnesota and the highest mountain in the world in the law of consistency, because of the law of intelligence, must also have a creator, and it could not be one globe of jelly. Based upon the law of contrast, wherever there's life, there's death, wherever there's light, there's darkness, wherever there's salvation, people are lost, wherever there's heaven, there's a hell, and based upon the law of contrast, the only book that ever made it in the five laws of education is the Bible. Not a religion, not a science, but the Word of God. Let's take science and place it in the law of the five laws of education. Spencer, Huxley, Dowling, Mance, Max Planck, I, Albert Einstein, and Newton, and many others, and take every one of their discoveries and summarize them, and, and being thankful for the contributions they made in the with the atoms and all the coordinating sciences of the atmosphere and its relevant sciences, but put every one of their discoveries and their contributions on the five laws of education, and you'll discover that every one contradicted the other one almost without exception. Spencer, Huxley, and Darwin, including Darwin, who got on his knees and repented of his evolutional theory. First, he repented that people misunderstood him, and second, he repented that he misunderstood himself. Lastly, he accepted Jesus Christ as a Savior, as a neurotic in a room, getting weaker and weaker. When we preached in Putnam, Connecticut, 11 years ago, the tract was published, Darwin Repents Received Christ directly with all the facts that accompanied his conversion. Now, our people in the colleges today do not read Darwin's tract. They do not say that Darwin repented of evolution and received Christ humbly on his knees as a broken-hearted neurotic that didn't spend a happy day in the last 20 years of his existence. Reason being is because they're dishonest. Now, Darwin himself did more than repent that people misunderstood his 1854 work of the origin of the species. He, too, several years later, repented that he wrote it. He disagreed with Spencer and Huxley, and on and on it went. But I was shocked to understand that the Lord Jesus Christ, in Luke 24, 27 through 44, never disagreed once with Moses. As a Unitarian that was lost and headed for hell, who prided myself on being at least reasonably intellectual because of my appreciation at that time for art in every realm and keeping up to date with everything I could on art and sciences because I had the time to because that was my life. Firestone was my favorite program on radio, the Firestone Hour, and my appreciations were unique and different, or at least I thought they were. 
But the Holy Spirit spoke with this question. Knowing details and memorizing what Spencer and Huxley and Dowen and others had taught, studying the many, many years B.C. on what Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, the three great teachers taught, and realizing that the best that they could produce was something that could only help in a temporal way, but never change your life. And realizing that written hundreds of years before, Jesus Christ never once discredited, went against, denied, or differed from Moses, from David, from Abraham, from the prophets, or the signs. It was a thrilling challenge because for the first time, saying nothing, subjectively I was overwhelmed by facing my intellectual five laws of education with an amazing stimulation in the mind. And then I studied the various religions, Protestantism, Catholicism, Buddhism, and what have you. And finally, the Spirit of God says, now it's time to study the Word of God. I wrote a book called Let's Go Fishing for Men, which needs to be republished. We've sold it five times. And its publications have gone all over America, Germany, France. But we're out of it right now. But in that book... We went into claims and evidences from this experience, from this research, and from the conversion. Remember, we are Unitarian. Keep in mind that we're not going to the Bible by faith, but by going to the Bible, we end up in faith. Keep that clear. You'll have people that will say to you, don't try to prove the Bible. I differ with that. I tried to and got converted. For that reason, 60% of all the converts that I won in Wiscasset, which was literally hundreds on personal house-to-house -house visits, was through the prophecy plan and no other way. Principals of high school, teachers, all walks of life. I had meetings with these educators, sometimes eight in the night, with this prophetic plan through the openings of God. On the left-hand side, I would put claims. On the right-hand side, I would put evidence. In the middle, I didn't believe and did not want to discover because of a wicked, rebellious, deceitful heart. God was good to me in getting a hold of Scripture references and concordance and coordinating my mind in a supernatural orientation and revelation because that was his will. And I discovered that in Ezekiel, the 12th chapter and the 25th verse, he said, of all that I've said shall come to pass. In John's Gospel, the 14th chapter and the 29th verse, he said, I've told you these things before they come to pass, that after they come to pass, you might believe. And I remember so well reading that verse and swallowing pride and saying to God, that's fair. That's fair for a natural-minded doubter. When he said, of all that I've said shall come to pass, my heart answered silently, that's fair. And then he said, I tell you these things before they come to pass so that afterwards, of course, you will believe. And I said, if I can prove that what you've said literally, honestly, practically has come to pass, I'll believe. And this is what the Word of God taught me. Number one, I was very interested in the simple creation story. I went into the Boston University libraries and tried to discover some other initiations for the cause of it all, but could find none except one cell. Creation, the way God said he did it in Genesis, 
the way he said he created things, the seven-day week. And I beautifully discovered what Albert Einstein said in one of his great works, in one of his writings on discoveries in the air, when Albert Einstein said, the practical order of the creation story cannot be denied because of the order of existence in human nature versus the nature of God's atmosphere. And he said it cannot be denied that the water was separated, that vegetation was the third day, that the sun, moon, and stars, they were the fourth day, the fish of the sea and fowl of the air were the fifth day, the animals and man the sixth day, and God rested on the seventh. Here's a man who at this time believed in God, but in no wise had confessed his faith in Christ, but acknowledged the creation story. And of course, because I didn't go by the Bible, what he said impressed me, but more, moreover, I realized this, that God claimed that he made the seven-day week. At that moment in my life, I was still in a seven-day week. So that made Genesis very fresh and up-to-date. God claimed that he separated the ferments. They're still separated, and you can prove where they were not. God claimed that he created vegetation, and it was still before me. The sun and the moon and the stars and the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the animals and man, they were all here. God claimed it, and they were all here. Needless to say that the elements that made up the chemical part of the man did come from the dust of the earth, and in my book I have them all written out one by one and named from Genesis 2-7. And then, with all of this, I said, at Boston University, uh, there must be other claims besides evolution to creation that can tell why it happened this way. But there were none. The five laws of education could only be challenged by the story of God on creation. And then we went into the amazing story of God... Uh, making man and woman, and man and woman are still here today. I do not see any crossbreeds in the processes of evolution. I do not see any absolute sight evidence of what is claimed, but I do see man and woman, and they're still here today, just as Jesus Christ said they were. They do have something that the lower animal kingdom does not have, and that's the ability to know themselves and to know God or at least to know that they have a need for something outside of their own souls in worship. But then we went into what we call the truth about science. The Word of God teaches in Psalm 147, verse uh, 4 and verses 5, and also in Isaiah, the 40th chapter, and verse 26 that the stars are as the sand of the sea, and God calls them all by name. It's an amazing thing that when the high-powered telescopes in the 18th century came into existence, Pasquale beautifully said that the stars are without number. But Potelemy in the 10th century said there was a thousand and six stars. His successor and contemporary said there was 1,308. But finally, under the high-powered telescopes, scientists caught up with what the Word of God said. Is it any wonder that Second Peter, the first chapter, the 19th verse teaches that the Word of God is sure? And knowing this, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of old were moved as God breathed and inspired their hearts by the Word of God. So I said, I will not privately interpret the Word of God, I'll accept it as it is, and the Bible says it's sure and steadfast and unchanging in its eternal, intelligible effect. And so immediately, God showed me in Isaiah, the 40th chapter and the 22nd verse, about walking in the circle of the earth. And once again, though recently it was said not to be a circle, then one year later again this was totally denied, and they said, of course it is. The Word of God always standing true. The Scriptures, in their beautiful way, 
explaining the story of why ice freezes on top in the mystical realm of chemistry in Job the 38th chapter and the 30th verse. One of the most amazing things that in my research in going from astrology, astrologist to astrologist, I discovered what Job said about the seven stars that make up the Pleiades, that hold the solar system together. The Word of God speaks of that in Job the 33rd, 38th chapter and the 31st verse. And when the Word of God, hundreds of years in advance, to be exact, 1,600 years in advance, a minimum of 1,600 years, tells the story of seven stars that hold the solar system together before the 18th century when the high-powered telescopes put their views on seven stars and they said they hold the whole solar system together. God told Job this. And God cannot lie in Titus 1-2. It's impossible for God to lie in Hebrews 6-18. Not one single word of God's promise will ever fall to the ground in 1 Kings 8-56. Let God be true and every man a liar in Romans 3-4. And God is not a man that he can repent in Numbers 23-19. The word of God is true. And that's why the highest form of education in the world is a Bible college. Not a single education that your children could get could even remotely compare to the intelligence, the amazing revelations and foreknowledge of reality in which people become the substance of God's eternal being as they express his attributes and characters in the misdemeanors and felonies of confusion and conflict in a satanic atmosphere. Now to continue... I want you to consider the following. The Word of God beautifully taught hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened. The Word of God said it. In Job, the 28th chapter, the 24th and the 25th verses, it speaks of the light and the east wind. This doesn't mean much to you, but if you realize this, this afternoon that the Word of God told that story hundreds and hundreds of years before the first part of the 18th century when Pasquel beautifully discovered the connection between the light and the east wind, bringing its electronic force to make the currents of the atmosphere parallel in the necessary functions of God's formation to make oxygen uh, survive within the hearts of people and the lungs of people upon the earth. This was discovered hundreds of years by God's inspiration before science ever acknowledged what God had already revealed, not through any other means, but by clear-cut, divine inspiration. Well, then we go into the laws that do not mean much to you today because you accept them and take them for granted, because you do not research, you do not consider their origin, you do not consider their contemporary correlating importance and significance in the relationship of their intelligent beginning. But that is simply this. The law of condensation, evaporation, precipitation, electrical precipitation, and these particles that make up the massive and strange and mystical circle of the weather in the atmosphere. Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, and by the way, you need to listen to this very carefully and not go to sleep. This is an unusual revelation because I'll be bringing in things that I've never brought in. In Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, the Word of God clearly teaches how the rivers and how the weather works, going, the rivers traveling from circle to circle and going back to where they started again. The Word of God beautifully teaches in Job once again the 26th chapter and also the 28th chapter about the amazing atmosphere in which it evaporates, then it condenses according to the distillment thereof, and the clouds release their water according to their evaporation through condensation, that he makes lightnings and thunders for his purpose in the expression of his own temperature in the air. The amazing story of, of condensation, evaporation, 
electrical separation. Inspired by God 2,450 years approximately before one scientist knew a single thing about it. I'm suggesting that anyone that doesn't enter into these things, that thinks it has to do with relativity, is unintelligent, unfair, unjust, and also going down a trail of ignorance because of a lack of insight and exploration into the relativity of true reality in the name of God searching for relevant substance. And then the Word of God goes into many other areas. I'll not take the time to continue in science except to say this. In Zechariah, the twelfth chapter, or rather the fourteenth chapter and the twelfth verse, the Word of God says that it would be a, an instrument or an invention so powerful that when it exploded that the eyes would melt in the holes and the tongue would melt in the mouth. Revelation, the 18th chapter, in three different verses in that chapter, complements that prediction by saying that people would stand afar off of fear of its torment. Well, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, when the atomic bomb exploded, and 140,000 died in 10 minutes, 300,000 casualties. Amazing things happen as the eyes would melt in the holes and the tongue would melt in the mouth through this amazing radiation which completely and totally shocked and astonished and subdued the viewers when one grandmother reported that she saw the baby melt before her very eyes. She saw the taxi cab driver hair come off. She saw somebody else's skin come off. Their eyes dropped out of their holes. The taxi cab driver that gave that great report to the New York Times in 1969 told the horror story of what he remembered and what he saw as he, gave a, as he expressed to them the fear that still remained in his heart because of the amazing atomic explosion. This was predicted in Zechariah 12.10. You say this is a private interpretation. Of course it isn't. It obviously and simply is the absolute truth. It'll be something worse than that will happen in the end days, in the tribulation period, that'll make that look like a picnic in a Sunday school day. The Word of God says in Revelation 18 that people will stand afar off. The taxi cab driver said they was racing from wherever radiation was working, trying to get out of it, trying to get out of it, running afar off, as Revelation 18 predicts will happen more than once in the wrath of God. All right? Then we go into the amazing tr principles of Daniel, the twelfth chapter, in the fourth verse. Knowledge shall increase. I want you to realize there has never been so much educational emphasis as there was after the Eisenhower administration. I'm not against it. I'm simply stating that it's true. The Eisenhower administration put out a plea a across the nation that Russia was way ahead of us on many different facets in science, and we had to have an emergency educational uh, uplift in order to catch up. We have done so. Knowledge has increased. Can you imagine? The same book in Daniel tells us that there'll be men will be going across the sky and the air as lightning. Can you picture with me in 1975? If we went back to 1925, and what would you think if someone said that there would be possible to, to have a nylon cord attached to a capsule and go across America in eight minutes? In 1925, you would be shocked and absolutely overwhelmed beyond imagination and would say, somebody's crazy. But naturally, it has long since been history. In 1975, a man, a person can be attached to a nylon cord, attached to a capsule, and go across America in eight minutes. Is it any wonder that Jesus Christ said, tell them just before I come back, that men will be as lightning in the skies. Nothing to say about a space. I want you to see with us the amazing accuracy of the Word of God. Nahum, the second chapter, the second verse written approximately 2,400 years in advance, said that just before Jesus came back in its continuity and context with its correlation of revelation, that chariots, remember all they had in those days were chariots. 
So if they'd said automobiles, they wouldn't have known how to communicate what they meant. But chariots, modern chariots, would be raging in the highway. They would run like torches and seem like lightning. They would jostle against each other and crowd each other on the highway. Needless to say, the traffic is doing that so amazingly today that Nahum chapter 2 is no longer a prophecy. It is now the truth in action. Jesus said, I've told you these things before they come to pass, that after they come to pass, you might be a believer. I'm saying it to the college students. Get your training. It's the highest form of education in all the world. Do not miss classes. Be disciplined. Be ready to take this proclamation across the world. And now we'll continue. The Word of God goes into the amazing truth of Leviticus, the 15th chapter and the 13th verse. In that great verse, it tells us of the law of sterilization. The law which by the word of God teaches, do not put your hand in a still watered basin, but nevertheless under running water. From that, Sam Weemillis in 1876 and also others realized the importance of sterilization and many maternity cases that were dying overwhelmingly and rapidly were stopped through Leviticus 15.13 revelation to a doctor. Sam Wee Mellis in Boston alone said that he felt that that law of sterilization salvaged 50% of lives at that time within 30 days. This is what the Word of God says. He didn't get this from anywhere else but the Word of God. The Bible teaches also in Leviticus the 13th chapter about the Black Plague. It's amazing and it's so beautiful. A fourth grader in England discovered something reading the Bible one day while the black plague was going on. He cried out and he said, this is the act. And because of the desperation and the deaths that were occurring, they listened to him. He said, quarantine. And they said, where did you ever get such an idea? It's strange that we had not thought of it. And he said, it's what God told Moses. They did it. And according to this great doctor in Holton College who has written that book on none of these diseases, that salvaged the masses and saved Europe in the Black Plague. What did? Leviticus, the 13th chapter. The amazing story of Proverbs, I believe it's the 8th chapter in the 26th verse, which speaks of the dust particles in the atmosphere that causes our various colors and the harmony of the sun and the reflection of the rays, etc. This was told in Proverbs 2100 years before it could be explained by modern science. What a book. What a thrill to know it. It's the most up-to-date book in America. It will tell you what will happen tomorrow, what will happen to eternity, It'll even tell you in the categorical order who it will happen to as far as categories, and I do not mean names. The amazing book that's so inspiring, so thrilling, which is the foundation of all life, the revelation of all truth, the correlation of all consistency and substance and relevant matter and being in person and things. The Bible. The Word of God. Is it any wonder that Proverbs, the 30th chapter, in the 5th verse, says that every word of God is pure? Is it any wonder that Second Timothy, the 3rd chapter, so beautifully says that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God as God breathes and is possible and is profitable, all of it? Is it any wonder that the Word of God says in Second Timothy, the 2nd chapter, and the 15th verse commands it to every person living, not just Bible school college students, but every person living, study to show thyself approve a workman that needeth not be ashamed. Is it any wonder that Revelation, the 22nd chapter, and the 17th and the 18th verses, the Word of God says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if any man taketh away from the words of the book of this prophecy, it said book, it didn't say revelation, it said book, 
Psalm 40, verse 7, Hebrews 10, verse 7, the entire 66 books are one book in God's eyes, and it says book. If any man will take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. If any man add unto the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. I don't want to be guilty of it. I know more than that. I'm more sensible than that. I'm more intelligent than that. And I'm more practical than that. I might have been successful in business, but I'm not going to be a fool that goes to hell in my terrible failure to be reasonable. I'm intelligent enough to be practical, to research, to explore, and to relate, and to understand, to weigh, and then to accept what is truth. Well, continuing on, the Word of God beautifully tells us in the ninth chapter of Amos, in the third verse, that one day before Jesus would come back, that a boat, or men would get in a boat and go underwater and live, the submarine. The Word of God in Ecclesiastes tells a story of signals going into the air and beautifully says they will be seen and heard in the home. 2,100 years before radio and television, the same in telegraph system, etc. The most beautiful revelation of these things in all the Bible, the greatest book in the world, the highest form of education with not one single exception. The highest form of education. There is not a single thing that can compare with it. I'll debate with any professor. I'll argue with any person in the world and come out ahead in every realm of science, in every realm of in every subject because I have the truth behind me and not theory. Now then, I want you to see also that in the scriptures now, it is time to get in to the story that is such a blessed story that we have considered on several occasions. And that is, first of all, I think I'll consider the story of Babylon, that great city the city of seven wonders with the historical beauty the scientific genius the amazing geographical design of Babylon in the 13th chapter of the book of Isaiah in the 19th and 20th verse the word of God says it will fall and it will never rise again the 50th chapter of Jeremiah and the 4th verse complements Isaiah 13 Babylon did fall and it will never rise again the system will rise, but contrary to Mr. Larkin and others, the city will not. Babylon has fallen. She will not rise again. Now, Ezekiel, the 26th chapter, the first five verses, tells us of Tyre. The Word of God says that Tyre, which was prospering as a tremendous, effective, and successful commercial port, will be destroyed, but will never be rebuilt and will only be a place for the spreading of nets. Ever since Alexander the Great came and destroyed Tyre, that great commercial port, she has only been, to this very hour, 1975 in January, a place for the spreading of nets. Amazing that she was never rebuilt, considering she had the potential and there was no real reason why she could not be, except God cursed Tyre, geographically because of sin. The Word of God says that there would also, in the fourth and fifth verses, be a rock runaway built through the city made out of the sand. Alexander the Great had his people take the stones from the dirt and from the sand and build an amazing, an amazing rock runaway type of bridge. Predicted, predicted literally 1900 years in advance. Needless to say, then Isaiah, the 44th chapter, the Word of God mentions Cyrus' name as king 90 years before he was born. We could go on and on with prophecy, but I'll head right now into our close into the nation of Israel. But before we do, I want you to think with me about Russia, the United Arab Republic, Ezekiel 38th chapter. Ezekiel 39, 4 through 9 tells us, that just before Jesus comes back, or in the latter days, 
that there would be a united Arab Republic. Who ever heard such a thing of a united Arab Republic in those days? And yet it pre predicted that there would be. And yes, in 1957 under Nasser, we saw in our, before our own eyes the united Arab Republic formed. But more than that, Ezekiel says in the 39th chapter, and also the 38th chapter, that Russia, Magog, capital Moscow, used to have two capitals, that she would join the United Arab Republic. Two years ago, last August 10th, she officially said that she was in union totally and completely with the United Arab Republic. Why would she join according to the word of God? Because she would go against Israel. Russia, who was, no, was non-existent when this prophecy was given, it was said would be a great giant nation north of Jerusalem whose capital would be Moscow, and she would be north of Jerusalem, and she would want to destroy the Jews because of the riches of Iraq, the Jordan, the Mediterranean seaboard, and the Dead Sea. You ask everyone tonight if she doesn't want those riches. She wants them desperately. She's there fulfilling prophecy. Her capital is Moscow. She does want those riches. Two million Jews stops her, and she's a member of the United Arab Republic. All totally and completely impossible, except we are dealing with a phenomenal, fantastic, amazing, astonishing, shocking, intelligent, relevant, practical, consistent, realistic, substantial, foundational truth. Now, the amazing thing, when Israel was, was prospering as America is today in her own right, the Lord Jesus made a prediction. In Deuteronomy, the fourth chapter, the 27th and 28th verses, in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, verses 63 through 68. First Kings, the ninth chapter, and the seventh verse, we'll summarize them. I am coming against Israel. She will be a byword on everyone's lips. She will be scattered abroad. She will be tormented in fear as she submits herself to her captives. God has said that all of her contemporaries would lose their national identity. In the 30th chapter of Jeremiah and the 11th verse. Ezekiel, the sixth chapter, the eighth verse, he said that she would not lose her national identity. She would remain as a national, with a national name in the world. Or there would be a remnant that would be saved. I want you to think with me. No longer do I hear about the Jebusites, the Moabites, the Kenites, the Hivites, but I do hear about Israel and the Arabs. Is the word of God true, written 2,500 years in advance? Yes, it is. Then think with me. Not only is the Lord Jesus Christ said that, but he said they would be a byword. I remember when the rag man that was a Jew came up to our house. I didn't know anything about history or Jews or anything. And I said to my mother, I'm going to take care of this. My father had died. And I said, I'm going to take care of our junk and our rags because he's nothing but an old Jew. Without me knowing a single thing about it, like hundreds in the world, he was a byword on my lips because God, at that time, had cursed, even though he was going to bless them and love them and make them a nation, at that time he had cursed their image because of they forsook him in disobedience and idolatry. But I want you to think with me now, very carefully. The Word of God makes it crystal clear that they would be scattered abroad and in captivity just before Jesus came back two days. Hosea 6, verses 2 and verse 3. Keep in mind that in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, having to do with the subject of prophecy, leaving itself in continuity of context. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is, is as one thousand years. Pertaining to eschatology, the event of the end times, one day, one thousand years. In 70 A.D., when Titus of Rome took over the temple and destroyed it, 1948, under the Harry Truman administration in May 14th, 
when two million Jews went back in unbelief and landed fulfilling Stephaniah. They came back from the east and Jeremiah 23, 7, 8, and 9 said they would come back first, I'm sorry, first from the north. Isaiah 11, 11, and 12 said later, south, west, east, first, north. Where did the two million come back from? North. Fulfilling a 2100-year prophecy in detail. Now, Sephaniah said unbelief. Did they go back at unbelief? Yes. Now, in approximately, the Hebrew says, two days they'll go back in unbelief. 70 A.D., 1948, nearly 2,000 years, two days, 2,000 years approximately. The Word of God says in Isaiah, the 40th chapter and the 31st verse, the 60th chapter and the 8th verse, that they would mount wings as eagles and fly as clouds as a dove does to the window, that they would run and not be weary, walk and not faint, and they would mount wings as eagles. 40,000 in 1948, when John Cameron Swayze was still on the news as a newscaster, 40,000 went back in one day in wings, planes, which went as eagles in the air predicted 2,443 years approximately before it happened and just happened to be decimal point on. Roger Babson, the third, possibly the third world-leading mathematician in the history of the world, said for any one of these prophecies to be fulfilled would be, for any two of them, would be two in 13 sectillion chances mathematically. Roger Babson, who now has his Technical Institute, the late Roger Babson, beautifully states that it brought him to his knees to accept Christ in simple repentance, to give up religion, to receive Christ, and he wrote a tract on the mathematical impossibilities of the scripture being wrong in any area, from the third world-leading mathematician in all the world. Now, who's intelligent? The pleasure-seeking intellectual that's intellectually poverty-stricken from reality or the true, sincere, honest, factual, realistic child of God. I'm not true. The Word of God says that before Israel would come back, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 6, he would curse the land, there would be no rain. Turn, go to Washington and check up by telephone to the meteorology department and discover that from 70 A.D. to 1934 was the lowest amount of rainfall in the history of any nation in Jerusalem, fulfilling Isaiah 5, 6. Then check up on 1948 to 1975 in Deuteronomy the 11th chapter, verses 13 through 16, and Ezekiel 36, after the drought, just before Jesus comes back, when they go back in unbelief, they came from the north primarily, they went back in planes, they were against the United Arab Republic, Russia was to their north, that the rains would come through a great provision of water. They have more water through a system of today and through an amazing new modern system since 1967 than they have ever had in their history, fulfilling Deuteronomy 11. Something for sure, certain certainties, thus saith the word of God. Now then, in Jeremiah 31, 36, 37, and 38, when they went back, it prophesied where they would start building the land. And what do you think? They've done it exactly like Jeremiah said to the decimal point, where they would rebuild. If you look at Jeremiah 30, but you say they could go by the Bible, but remember they don't accept Christ. And the New Testament, which is forfeit, that revelation. Now then, the Word of God says in Isaiah the 28th chapter and the 4th verse, Ezekiel the 36th chapter and the 8th verse, that when they went back, not only would the water come, but they would have fruit enough, and the fruit would go all over the world in export. It's already happening, and it has since 1953. It's been fulfilled. 
But then Isaiah, the 35th chapter, in the first verse, says that their deserts will bloom with roses. I have the pictures, the slides of the miles of beautiful flowers in the desert, what used to be desert. Nobody wanted it. No, the Arabs wouldn't work it. The Jews did, and they've got the most beautiful desert filled with roses now through their new system. You could not believe it. I've seen them on many occasions. And then I'll close with this. I'll just quickly mention the 70 weeks of Daniel. The ninth chapter, 24 through 27. 69 weeks, Leviticus 25, 3 and 4. Genesis 29, 27 says that in prophecy, a week is seven years. In prophetic, sabbatical, uh, contemporary weight, weight of value in prophecy. The week is seven years. 69 weeks when God dealt with the nation of Israel nationally. When the wall was being rebuilt to when Jesus Christ was crucified is exactly 69 weeks or 483 years. And the 69 weeks of Daniel have been fulfilled and were at his crucifixion. There is one more week of Daniel left and the church, the born-again believers, the bride, will not be here when it starts. We'll be in heaven in the rapture. That's the last week of seven years in Revelation, the twelfth chapter, the seventh verse, 1,260 days, three and one-half years of the last seven-year tribulation period or the last week of years. We'll not be here. That will be when Israel worships on Saturday. They are recognized in national worship and they are recognized until the, the head of the United States of Europe at that time prevents their worship in the middle after lying to them with a false peace and protection. But think of it with me. That has already been fulfilled. We'll never see the week of seven years, the last one, but we have seen the 69 fulfilled. Now, if the Lord Jesus Christ says that we must be born again. We must be prepared to go up in the rapture, which is the next advent. All prophecy has been fulfilled. The United States of Europe is being formed today beautifully as described in the Word of God in Daniel, the ninth chapter, and throughout the Word of God. Also Daniel 7, Daniel 11. And then not only is the United States of Europe being formed, but also... Think of it. Those that have been born again, not just religion, but born again, that have repented, that have received Christ, the moment you accept Christ, God gives you a gift of eternal life, and 36 things happen to you without you even knowing it, which protects you and saves you forever through the blood of the Lamb, through Christ, and through the Word of God, and through the Spirit. Then you receive Christ. Then you have to grow like everyone grows. But when the rapture comes, you go up, and those that are not saved, Luke 17, 33 through 35, they remain for the seven-year tribulation period. You go to heaven in the clouds of the air in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, but they remain for the cataclysmic incidences starting in Revelation 6 through Revelation 18 are the seven years of tribulation, three and a half years of peaceful coexistence, to end up in the last three and a half years of the terrible battle of, of Armageddon in the valley of Jehoshaphat where blood will be 200 miles long, 10 miles wide, and six feet deep. Human blood. You may not like this, but just as true as all the other prophecies, it is absolutely going to happen in every decimal point. But Christians that are truly saved will not be here. We'll be home to be with the Lord. For this is the wrath of God that has been stored up in six or seven thousand years, finally being poured out in three and a half years. God has not appointed unto us wrath in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, but deliverance. There is no condemnation for us in Romans 8, 1, any believer in America that's truly born again. Why? Because he took our sin and our wrath and our place 
and we believe on him and we don't have to pay for our sins or wrath. 1 Peter 2.24, John 5.24, John 3.36 in everybody's Bible. Now, how deeply grateful this afternoon to be on this side of intelligence. Many people do not know the truth and they're not free. They are living in a body of death in Romans 7, 24. It's appointed unto man once to die in Hebrews 9 and 27 and after that the judgment. They'll have to pay for their own sins. Whether there's light, there's darkness. Whether there's truth, there's error. Whether there's love, there's hate. Whether there's purity, there's impurity. Whether there's heaven, there's hell. Whether there's forgiveness, there's judgment. But every child of God can be assured that they'll never have to pay for a single thing. They can be saved and born again and love and share and communicate truth. When you get to heaven, it will not matter if you was a professor of a school, but it will matter if you're saved. When you get to heaven, it will not matter if you was a world traveler, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it will matter if you've gone into the world to share Christ through a body. And I want to suggest this, that you students put your hand to the plow. Do not forfeit your privilege. Do not deviate from your opportunity and do not go away from your divine option. Do not take things in your own hand and never do that that's right in your own eyes. But follow the word of God, the most practical, brilliant, intelligible revelation known to man. We know what's going to happen tomorrow before it happens. And we're never wrong. Because God has told us. The rapture is coming. The tribulation is coming. The second coming of Christ is coming. Earthquakes in California are coming. Terrible tornadoes in Central America. We predicted them before they happened. You heard us. Three cataclysmic things in America. Six in the world. And the only ones that will really survive... Anybody in all the world that is truly saved and truly born again, that's truly blood-bought and believe in Jesus Christ, have received Jesus Christ, you can't believe in anybody but Jesus Christ and be saved. You can't be saved by religion or good works or just going to a church when you're a baby. You have to be born again with a personal experience through Christ like I was and every other man and woman in America. The Oakland Athletics manager, Alvin Dark, puts it this way. I was a manager of the world champion Oakland Athletics, but every breath I take, he says, comes from Jesus Christ, my Lord, my Savior, my blood-bought Redeemer. Rico Petroselli of the Boston Red Sox said that he was empty all of his life until he received Christ when we interviewed him on telephone time. And it doesn't make any difference if it's Bobby Pettick, the great basketball star, or the well-known and popular autogram of football fame. It doesn't make any difference who it is, or whether it's Colleen Townsend, the beautiful Hollywood actress that in the middle of her career got totally converted and gave up Hollywood and called it a cheap Christianity for those that continued, and this beautiful, amazing woman with all the natural beauty of heaven got on her knees and said, No longer do I scream and dream when I go to bed. $100,000 a week contract, living in the highlights of glamour and popularity, she repudiated it all and now travels with her husband on Youth for Christ on Saturday nights, smiling in the glory of her new beauty, saying that Christ is worth it all. Colleen Townsend, it doesn't make any difference who it is. You need Christ. I need Christ. Once he comes in, I'm safe forever. But I need to grow in him, honestly, intelligently, and with obedience through faith. And this afternoon, I trust that pride, that insecurity and fear, religious confusion will not stop you 
by receiving a free gift, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior. You come just as you are, and by grace through faith and not of yourselves, you accept a living person. Religion is not a system. Christianity is Christ, a person. I'm speaking of the Christian religion. I don't care if you've been sprinkled or baptized or joined a church. You must be born again to be saved in any church, including this one. Because that's what the Word of God says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's a parathetical universal phrase in John 3, verse 3. John 1, 11, as many as receive him to them gave he power to become sons of God. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes in closing? Thank you for being a tremendous audience. We appreciate the attention and response of your heart.